Good morning, everybody. Appreciate you joining us again. Uh, this fourth lesson on the various names of God that we're studying uh, as he's revealed his characteristics and attributes to us uh, in, in the original language. Uh, there was multiple ways to express God. I know we always oftentimes just say God, but uh, we're looking at different different names. Uh, this week is El Olam, uh, which is God is eternal. God is everlasting. That's really a question of how does God see? Last week we did El Roi, which was the God who sees. Uh, and this week we're going to look at El Olam, uh, which is the everlasting, eternal God of all time, God of ages, unchangeable God, the God of perpetuity. You know, the infinity sign. And when we just sit for a moment and ponder and think about that everlasting, eternal, unchangeable perpetuity, that really lends itself to a, probably a lot of thought and question and wonder because humans can't understand that. Everything about our entire experience is linear and time bound. And so sometimes it's very difficult, if not impossible, to really understand and appreciate what it means to be everlasting and eternal, perpetuity, unchangeable. Uh, but El Alam, uh, we are going to study today, is a way that we can, we can recognize and praise, praise the Father, uh, praise the God that created everything uh, and provided for us a Messiah, a Savior, so that we can be restored back to him. So it really is all about perspective, right? The perspective on things. Sometimes when you set out to find something, you're almost guaranteed to find it. For instance, if I want to be offended, I can find a thousand things a day to be offended by. If I want to feel like I'm blessed, I can find a thousand things to be blessed about every day. I've just lived my life in a way that I recognize that early in life. I was taught that early in life, and it really has done me well uh, to keep a perspective about things that it's, it's really interesting how I will find that what I'm looking for. And I have a perspective that I can see. And I want you to picture with me if you were walking through, say, the forest or somewhere where there was a lot of vegetation, what you could see would be limited. If it wasn't for those fancy GPS or a compass, sometimes we could even lose our way because we may lose sight of the sun. So in life, we're sometimes, as the expression goes, head down. We're just going through it. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we lose sight of what and who God is? How is El Olam bringing himself glory through what he's doing for you? The Bible says he's gone ahead, and we follow in the blessings that he has gone ahead for us. It's really an awesome promise for those of us that are children of his. For those of us that have recognized that we are frail and sinful and we need a savior and a messiah. But what is it that we can really see? I love 1 Corinthians 13, 12. The entire chapter of 13 is great. But 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. He's writing about the time that will come when we will have much more understanding. We will never be God, but we will have much more understanding because we will not be in this broken, sinful world anymore when we enter into eternity into heaven, uh, the place that the Lord has gone to prepare for us. And it's interesting. Some of you may be thinking, oh, I've heard other philosophers use that. I've, you know, all we can see is on a cave. And yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, God's truth exists, and sometimes, you know, folks will twist it and think that the truth is in the person, or the truth is in the universe, or the truth is somewhere else, and unfortunately, it's just a poor substitute. But the Bible tells us the best that we can see is as if in a mirror dimly lit, but it's enough. God says that we are without excuse. The Bible says that we're at without excuse. So let's look at Genesis 21, 33. That's the kind of the primary scripture for today, although we're going to have a lot of other scripture. Genesis 21, 33 says, And then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, worshipped Yahweh Elulam there. We're going to come back to the story in a second, but the picture that you see 
is a tamarisk tree. It's not native here in, in the U.S. or the Southeast U.S. That's actually in Israel. Uh, and they grow in desert places and they're evergreen. So we're going we're gonna to look at that. Think, keep, keep in mind perspective and in being an evergreen tree. And then also in Isaiah 40, verse 28, don't you know? Haven't you heard? Alulam, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, doesn't grow tired or become weary. His understanding is beyond reach, or in some translations, beyond understanding. His understanding is beyond our understanding. We cannot know the mind of God. So we're going to cover four in this outline today, four aspects, four things, if you will. Uh, God's perspective, God's pronouncement, God's provision, and God's promise. And this picture, it just kind of reminded me, I, I found it because I, I was thinking, okay, so how would we maybe illustrate how God can see so much more detail than we can? And again, it's pretty hard sometimes because it's so incomparable, but let me try. The picture on the far left is just, say, me standing on a balcony looking in that direction. Looks like a skyline. It's the best that I can see. The picture on the right is after significant digital magnification. Same picture, same stuff, same location. But because I had the equipment and the ability, I could zoom in to where I could actually see a window on that building that I can barely make out in the picture on the left. And I want to keep that in mind as we're going through this, because one of the aspects of, of really growing in our relationship with the Lord, growing in our trust, is that we have to come to the realization, recognition, and we have to own it, that our creator is able to see infinitely more, both in detail and in scope. And maybe this picture will maybe frame that for you from now on, that it's the same information. He's just able significantly more than we can. So in Job chapters 38 through 41, some of my personal favorite passages of scripture, I'm not going to read all of them to you, although I debated it uh, because I absolutely love it. Uh, there's, there's just so much truth in it. Maybe one day we'll study Job. Job 38. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, Job, and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched out the line upon it? Where were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out of the womb? Who said, this far you shall come and no further? Here shall your proud waves be stayed. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? Where is the place of darkness? That you may take it into its territory, that you may discern the path to its home. You know, for you were born then, and the numbers of your days are great. Listen to this. This is in verse 31. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season or guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? I'm not sure how many of you realized that in scripture, these constellations are included. Maybe this is the first time that you realize that. And I encourage you to continue to read in Job 38. Through 41, and you may be surprised at just how much is in there. We're, we're told that Job is actually the oldest recorded book. Um, how much is in there that may re make make kind of make you rethink a few things in terms of maybe what you thought before about what our ancestry as humans maybe understood, maybe even more than we did to a degree. And he continues on in chapter 40. Behold, Behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength in his loins, his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. 
He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring his sword. Or, Job, can you draw out Leviathan? Press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Oh, lay your hands on him. You'll remember the battle. You will not do it again. Behold, the hope of a man is false. I will not keep silent concerning his limbs or his mighty strength or his frame. Who can strip off his outer garment? Who would come near him with a bridle? Who can open the doors of his face around his teeth of terror? His back is made of rows of shields, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezings flash forth light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils come forth smoke, as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame comes forth from his mouth. Job, where were you? Where were you, Job? Same question gets asked to us, right? We live in a day and age that we really feel like we have everything figured out. And sometimes we forget that we don't. And I love Job 38 through 41. In particular, if you're reading that, you may be thinking, oh, that sounds an awful lot like certain his historic, prehistoric animals that we can think of. How is it that's even being described in scripture? You know, that's again, not a lesson for today, but some of you may not have realized that that, that was actually in scripture. Um, we know the story of Job, but the particulars of Job when God is talking back and it's recorded for us is pretty amazing. So let's, let's kind of unpack a little bit real fast uh, these four elements about this everlasting God. It's his perspective. We can look in Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed, the, or had you had formed the earth, and the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are Elohim. John 1.1, 1, 1, love this verse. Some of you could probably quote it as well, and you may quote it in a different version like I do in my head. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, in the beginning, with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Of course, this is referring to, to the Messiah, to Christ, but I uh, love this passage, right? So the perspective that God has is the big, 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 perfect picture. You know, for those of us that like sports, you can think about, you know, baby being on a football field and being on the sidelines. You know, sometimes coaches like to go up to the press box. Why? Perspective. They may be able to see something with the different formations and, and the different players and, and how things are coming together that they cannot see at ground level. Right? So sometimes you have to change up your location to change up your perspective. Sometimes God does that for us. Sometimes we're obedient and we do that willingly. But if we need to change a perspective, God's going to get us to where we have to be. And sometimes it means moving us. And sometimes we have to say, leave the sideline where we think that we're supposed to be. But nope, God's actually called us to go and do something different so we can see a different perspective on things. Secondly is God's pronouncement. God is holy. God is righteous. God is perfect. And the pronouncement, the word of the Lord says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So while this is a lesson on keeping our perspective on God, we always have to bring it back to the gospel. The gospel is for man. The gospel is for people. The gospel says that we have a way back to the Father because this pronouncement, God, as sure as God exists, has said, the wages of sin is death. What we're going to get because of sin is going to be death, but there is a way because God is, has a provision. He actually has provided as a solution to the pronouncement. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may now, that you may know you have eternal life. First John 5, 13. And then John 3, 16, right? Everybody knows that one. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life or everlasting life, right? Of course, I didn't even read it that way because I've memorized it in a different version. But how many of you know John three seventeen? It is a fantastic verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
Did you know that verse? God provided a provision to deal with his pronouncement. So he sees everything. And he knew that humanity would fail and humanity needed to be restored. So he provided a provision. So let's look at God's promise. Psalm 118, 29 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. That's his promise. That's one of thousands of promises in the Bible. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, never forsake you. Now just just simmer on that for a second. The God of everything that you see and don't see. If you've accepted Christ, or you're feeling it right now that there's something that needs to be settled. At the moment that that happens, the promises of God become yours because you become a child of his. And one of those is, he will never believe you. He will never forsake you. Have you ever had a human leave you, abandon you, disappoint you, forsake you, hurt you? Yeah, of course you have, unless you just were born today. It happens to everybody because we live in a fallen world. It is wonderful to have a creator and a Messiah that says, no, no, not anymore. In this amplified translation, which is just a, a different verb, you know, it's just a different way to say it. It's, it's not as tightly translated, if you will. It says, I will never, no, not ever, ever, never leave you behind, abandon you, give up on you, send you back, leave you helpless, disregard you, or relax my presence with you. It's a wonderful promise. So let's go back to where we started. The perspective that I mentioned before, okay? Abraham planted this tree in Beersheba. Last week, we looked at some of the lineage, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect these two things together because Abraham recognized El Olam on the heels of this, okay? So in Genesis 21, it's a king uh, in Canaan, which is the Philistines, okay? King Abimelech. There were a lot of those, but this was a particular one, okay? Uh, he was a king then, which is basically Canaan, which is the Philistine area. So if you were to go back and maybe pull up the other video and look at some of the history, it would be like, oh, wow, how about that? Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a thread there from Noah to Abraham, okay? So there's a thread. Several hundred years has gone by. And they're making a covenant because this guy recognizes that Abraham is on the ascendancy. He is really becoming powerful and influential in the region. And he can look at his God, if you will, and say, wow, he's really getting blessed. And he wants to make a covenant. He wants to make a deal. He wants to make a promise that Abraham, you know, wouldn't basically attack him. And so Abraham did. So I, I challenge you. I mean, you can go find Genesis 21, read around this verse, and maybe it'll help you understand when Abraham was recognizing, he recognized that, that God's perspective, that God's everlasting nature, he worshiped that, in fact, at Beersheba. It was the first time in Abraham's life that he finally had a place because that place had a well. And obviously, you can imagine having access to water in a relatively barren area or water generally is very important. And this was the first time then that Abraham had that. And I'm sure Abraham knew they, you know, they, they knew history. They, they knew their lineage a lot better than we do, right? We're, we're pretty proud if we can go back to like our great grandparents, but they made a very intentional effort about knowing their lineage, knowing where they came from, knowing their histories. Okay. And it's significant to understand the context with which this attribute of God gets used. So what is God weaving? In your life, some of you like to weave. This is the back of a tapestry. You could guess all day long, and some of you might guess, or some of you might have a general idea of what that might be, but it's just the back of a tapestry. You know, don't tear up your stuff at your house, but if you found a tapestry, look on the back of it, it would look just a mess like this, because that's the nature of it. That's how they're made, and it looks like utter chaos. This picture sits with my head a lot, because I look and say, one day, I'm going to understand. God, the pain, the blessing. I want to understand a perspective. For right now, it feels like a hot mess. I can't see what it is that you're making. So again, this was the picture from last week with the genealogy. These people also did not know where exactly they fell 
in the story that God was directing. Didn't know. But there it is. And so what is God weaving in your life? So that's the final product on the right there. It's a nice, pretty crown. I look forward to seeing whatever it is in your life, just like in my own. You know, at this point in my life, I have enough life that I can go back and look and say, wow, even when I stubbed my toe, even when I took, I tried to take control of the, the needle, even when I tried to change the color of the yarn, even when I failed, God is still working and his perfect plan is still in play. And my prayer for you, my prayer for me, my family, is that, that we will recognize and appreciate God, El Olam, the everlasting, eternal God. Because he's weaving something beautiful. One day we will see it. I pray earnestly that if you do not know Jesus Christ personally as your Messiah, that through the course of hearing this lesson, talking to other people, please deal with it. You'll never have peace otherwise. And it's not as if this is magic. This isn't like a genie. It, it, is, it just changes your perspective because then you're, you start getting the blessings that the Bible promises. And if you wonder, is the Bible true? Is the Bible accurate? Can the Bible be trusted? Those are lessons that we've covered, and I'll, we'll probably cover again at some point in the future, but that's not for this. This is about something more specific. How is God weaving? What is, what is God doing in your life? If you read Job 30 through 41, it, I mean, even not most of Job, it talks about how God, you know, on the righteous and unrighteous, God is in control. So if you don't know him yet, you don't have the blessings, but I, I would love for you to. John 3, 16, John 3, 17, so many other verses. Well, all we have to do is recognize and own that we are a sinner, that we have failed, and that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. And through him and only him, can I have restoration with the Father? So once again, these are the seven attributes, the seven names, if you will, that we are studying. We are on El Olam, which is the fourth one on that list. And why, again, are we doing this? Again, number one, if you do not know the Lord personally through the Messiah, I want you to do that. Secondly, once you do, it's to help us grow in our boldness to stop living cowardly but instead live courageous in the power of the Messiah through Christ who strengthens me because I can put my trust, my confidence, my hope in something much bigger than myself. Easter was a handful of weeks ago now. This started around then, started this lesson, this whole set, because I want to remind you, on Easter Sunday, no one went to the tomb expecting to see a risen Savior. None of them. The women went to final bury him. No one went with the expectation. They were where? In, the, in a room, hiding, afraid. These were the people who had spent three years ministering with him in that region and saw firsthand. Can't criticize them, and we're, we're human just like they are, but we're studying these names of God so that we can grow in our discipleship, so that we can take this message, this gospel message, it can grow in our life and we can share it with other people. Show them the love, biblical love. There's a lot of talk about love and there's going to be a lot of talk about love coming up. And, you know, I just want you to know the Bible has a, the definition of love. I pray for you. I pray that God will give you the boldness to proclaim the truth, speak the truth in love. Thank you so much for joining us. May the Lord go with you, keep you, and may you walk in his blessings. Thank you.